It's that time of the year. Your vacation is coming up. You can already hear the beach waves, feel the warm breeze, relax, and think about work. You really, really want it all to work out while you're away. Monday.com gives you and the team that peace of mind. When all work is on one platform and everyone's in sync, things just flow. Wherever you are, tap the banner to go to Monday.com. When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Kroger, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make shopping Kroger worth it every time. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply. I can't wait, because mine and Carmen Carrion's new book, Freaky Folklore, Terrifying Tales of the World's Most Elusive Monsters and Enigmatic Cryptids, is coming July 16th, featuring the history and lore of terrifying folklore creatures from across the globe, alongside some cool and creepy illustrations. Pre-order today on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or your favorite bookstore, or go to eeriecast.com freak. The next 1,000 verified pre-orders will get a Freaky Folklore decal and a three-month subscription code to EerieCast Plus, and all entrants will get a free PDF sneak peek of the Freaky Folklore book. To verify and for more info, go to EerieCast.com freak. You may remember one Dr. Novak. He was the brilliant mind behind the creation of the Nanite Project, the man who found out what the Bureau intended to do with his work, and not only destroyed it, but himself and the scientist working against him. Well, thanks to the efforts of Dr. Novak, I was able to gain entrance to a secure Redwood Bureau server, one which contained thousands upon thousands of files. Combing through these files is a massive undertaking, and each is more horrific than the last. But it's not the horror of these contents, or the Bureau's callous and careless nature that I'm searching for. These things we already know. Buried deep within these archives are breadcrumb trails that I believe will lead us to the truth. Once we find out what they've done and how they've done it, we will know what they're going to do, and then hopefully, how to stop them. The case files I'm releasing now may seem benign when compared to previous entities and cover-ups. However, it isn't so much the contents of these files that caught my attention. It's what we now know they did with the discoveries within this case. Redwood Bureau Phenomenon 0976. Symbiotic Autonomia. Threat Level. Disastrous. Bacteria are some of the oldest and most resilient life forms on Earth. They can survive extreme environments, from the frozen permafrost of the Arctic to the scalding hydrothermal vents in the ocean floor. Some bacteria even have the ability to repair their DNA after significant damage, a trait that has evolved over billions of years. This resilience makes them a double-edged sword in scientific research, capable of groundbreaking medical breakthroughs or, in the wrong hands, unfathomable destruction. This file details the events at a third-party scientific research facility known for its lack of ethical boundaries and grave mistreatment of employees. Many reports indicated this facility more closely resembled a prison than a scientific research station. The experiments conducted there often pushed the limits of scientific understanding. The events at this facility led to a discovery that was as horrific as it was unexpected. One of the lead scientists, Dirk Hopkins, became entangled in a series of experiments that somehow left him infected with an unknown bacteria. Imagine your body turning against you at the cellular level, every cell being invaded and rewritten by a foreign entity. The pain, the madness, and the loss of control are beyond comprehension. This case file will reveal the extent of the facility's experiments and the lengths they went to in their pursuit of knowledge, regardless of the human cost. The truth must be revealed and the Redwood Bureau, the Redwood Bureau must, be stopped. must be stopped. White laminate flooring extends into pale hallways. 
the sterility almost suffocating. The fluorescent lights overhead flicker intermittently, causing a harsh, clinical glow on the concrete walls, which choke the environment, bouncing the light around the cramped corridor. I pass through a selection of doors on either side, each labeled with cryptic alphanumeric codes, finally entering the one at the very end of the hall. The lab is a maze of tables and counters, some laden with complex equipment, others holding tanks filled with various substances. One wall is dedicated entirely to a contained habitat. Inside, a dozen or so rats scurry about, plump and seemingly healthy. As I pass by, they pause for a moment, their tiny eyes reflecting the fluorescent light before resuming their frantic activities. I reach my desk and drop my clipboard, the papers detailing a newly discovered strain of bacteria. Beside me is a powdery substance, a medium containing a living example of the bacteria. Without an official name, I decide to refer to it as John for the time being. John was discovered inside permafrost, but it holds a special title. This is our first example of a living strain that's potentially alien, having been pulled from icy particulates that possibly survived an asteroid impact. This origin remains unconfirmed, as it could just as likely be an evolved environmental strain. The bacteria was gingerly removed from the ice by melting it and then drying it on this medium. Before exposing the bacteria, I prepare a growth medium in a petri dish. Growth mediums require nutrients like glucose to feed the bacteria and maintain their health. The gloves and suit I wear ensure no contamination. As I work, the lights above buzz, the noise magnified by the unnerving silence. Every sound I make, every scrape of my sleeve, every breath, seems amplified in the quiet, sometimes startling me. The oppressive silence can be maddening. There are several strains of microlife I'm studying, all newly discovered. My tests are meticulously recorded and screened before the reports are sent to my higher-ups. The results of John will be kept under wraps, known only to a select few in this building. It's not unlike the other strains, Bill, Francine, and Miles, all given temporary names due to my inability to officially name them. My superiors retain that right. Bill and Francine were found in the Amazon, while Miles was discovered in the Middle East. John might be the only potentially extraterrestrial bacteria anyone has ever worked with, so it receives my full attention. Bacteria are notoriously resilient, handling a lab environment far better than more fragile samples. The number of cultures I've lost due to varying temperatures or insufficient medium is frustratingly high. Bacteria, however, thrive in conditions that would destroy most other samples. With an assistant, I could have saved many cultures, but the company is particular about who they allow in here. Only certain people are deemed suitable often unrelated to their qualifications. I've met grad students and PhDs here. We gather for meals in a small cafeteria, finding some measure of socialization. Otherwise, we work until the day ends and return to our living quarters. Our living quarters are small, windowless rooms resembling large closets, with just enough space for a bed and a shower. It feels like a prison, but the company offers to pay off our debts and fund our research. My contract is for three years, during which time I spend no money living here. I finish preparing the petri dish and add a bit of the John strain 
before sealing it and placing it under warm lights. While waiting for it to grow, I turn my attention to the other strains. Bill is ready for live trials, where I will infect a rat and monitor the results. Francine will infect a second colony. After a few days, I'll have my results, euthanize the rats, and obtain new colonies. Bill resembles rabies in its transmission. Infected blood or saliva introduced into the healthy body. Francine, based on preliminary testing, seems to resemble hepatitis. Years of experience give me a gut feeling about these strains. Though final confirmation awaits the live trials. After finishing my day's work, I clock out for dinner. Dinner is the most peaceful time, with everyone too tired to be irritable. I sit at my usual table, up against the wall near a corner, close to my lab. Tonight's menu is chicken and rice with teriyaki sauce. As I wait for my food, two colleagues join me. So what's new in Dirk's lab? One of them asks. Is it yet another strain you can't discuss? Yes, sadly, I respond. I wish they'd give me something more straightforward. Come on, Dirk, you've got this. The other chimes in. So at least you're not working with AIDS or Ebola like me. You've got a point, Earl. I admit. Think about this, Zack adds. When your research goes public, you'll have the coolest stories. But it's a lot less interesting when I can't even say its name. Earl counters. This one is different, I inform them. It might never be released. Its origins are a mystery, its effects unknown. And I only got it yesterday. Want to hear about my experience with Papaloma? Zack asks. And we continue our conversation as the clock ticks away. The scent of teriyaki fumigates the cafeteria, making dinner warm and inviting. At 10 p.m., we disperse saying our goodbyes before heading to bed. The 10 p.m. bedtime is non-negotiable, enforced by guards who ensure we get to sleep. They lock our doors once we're inside, and the night is eerily silent, with only the occasional footsteps of a guard breaking the stillness. My small room has nothing more than my bed and a shower. The cramped space makes showering uncomfortable especially for somebody lanky like me. And any deviation, like wearing black socks, results in punishment. This strict uniformity and lack of individuality reinforce the dehumanizing atmosphere. At night, I do push-ups and sit-ups to tire my body and mind. As time passes, sleep finally takes over. The following day, a cold lump of semi-gelatinous mass sits on my table. Every minute motion nearby sends ripples through its colorless body. In an unorthodox way, our tests will involve observing how these bacteria behave within dead human tissue. Specifically, if they can survive within a carcass, and if so, for how long. This lump is adipocere corpse wax, dehydrated and clumped together body fat that forms a waxy substance. It's part of the putrefaction phase of human decay, where the body's fat begins breaking down on a chemical level. Our expectations aren't high. Adipocere doesn't provide much for bacterial life to flourish. These tests are straightforward. We introduce the bacteria to the adipocere and wait to see if the population grows or diminishes. I prepare three dishes for today. One for John, one for Francine, and one for Bill. After preparing this new test, I check on the previous Petri dishes. Francine seemingly didn't engage with the medium enough. Green lumps spread across it, but the medium beneath appears untouched. Miles consumed a lot of the medium but didn't grow significantly. 
This raises questions about Francine's growth without using more medium. Bill consumed his medium, with the culture having grown considerably. While John seems dormant, his tendrils, however, sprawl beneath the honey-like medium. Curious, I place John under the microscope. His tendrils, though weak, show signs of life, consuming the medium in tiny amounts. This is reminiscent of Francine, which also didn't utilize the entire medium, but survived. Perhaps they are picky eaters, or need little sustenance. The others are fine. In between growing cultures, there's not much to do. I reflexively check the petri dishes, going back and forth between my desk and the shelves. I have books in my office for research, but my thoughts are consumed by these bacteria. How will they fare in live subjects? I file a request for SCID mice, severe combined immunodeficiency, used to study diseases. I ask for 20 mice and prepare four enclosures. As I walk to the office of requisitions, my mind drifts to thoughts of the upcoming exposure tests. Perhaps I'll test everything but John, saving him for the SCID mice. I have six of them now and need to distribute them among the enclosures. One disease per enclosure to observe only the intended illness. Deciding between the cultures is hard, but John excites me the most. Under the microscope, bacteria float in a water bubble between two glass sheets. They interact minimally or swiftly, feeling around their environment and searching for food. Carnivorous bacteria seek out microlife to consume, sensing movement to acquire targets. John isn't aggressive. He wafts around, absorbing nearby organisms, creating a wave of apoptosis, cell death. At the head of this wave, the brilliant, defiant organism consumes all in its path. Next, I examine Francine, which scurries around the slide with vigor. Not carnivorous, but its ability to consume is immense. It produces smaller versions of itself, ejecting them into the environment. Soon, the slide is swarmed with these offshoots, leaving no matter behind. Under different lighting, Francine blends with its surroundings, its inner workings still a mystery. Finally, I observe Bill, initially boring and immobile. Concerning as this could mean the sample is dead, under closer inspection, its internal activity is astonishing. Dots flurry inside its walls, orbiting a pulsing nucleus. As its pulsations slow, Bill begins to move, creating small vortices to attract prey. It seems uninterested in consuming other microlife until a larger contaminant approaches. Bill evades the threat until it has no energy to run. The contaminant wraps around Bill, but quickly recoils, seemingly repelled by him. Bill then consumes the weakened opponent, unharmed and unbothered. I turn my attention to the rats. After sanitizing my tables, I hear a distinct thump in one of the enclosures. Each enclosure has a glass pane with tape reading the corresponding bacterial infection. The thump came from Francine's enclosure. One rat breathes heavily, taking a defensive stance, glaring at the wall. Suddenly, it darts forward, slamming into the wall, shaking the enclosure. The rat stands, shaking, then repeats the behavior every two minutes. Initially, I thought it has gone mad from isolation, but reconsider my initial assessment of Francine. The other rats seem fine, 
Bill's rat is calm. John's rats move slowly and in an organized manner, and Miles's rats appear normal. I leave for lunch, but upon returning find two dead rats in Miles' enclosure. The rat in Francine's is still ramming the walls, now more frequently. The peculiar behavior of these bacteria strains continues to consume my thoughts and dreams. The next day, I wake up disoriented, a pounding headache, and sore muscles. Leaning against my door, it refuses to budge. I realize with a racing heart I'm under quarantine. The guards outside inform me that I'm not allowed to leave my room until further notice. My head spins as I sit on the edge of my bed, trying to process the sudden quarantine. The sterile, oppressive atmosphere of my small room feels even more suffocating. I peer through the narrow slit at the top of the door, but the guard's face is impassive. He offers no further explanation and simply ignores me. The minutes drag on, each one stretching into an eternity. The silence is deafening broken only by the occasional echo of footsteps in the hallway. I start to notice small changes in my body. An itch that won't go away. A strange tingling sensation under my skin. Anxiety gnaws at me. Each feeling could be nothing. Or the beginning symptoms of an unknown bacterial infection. Hours later, my door swings open, and two guards in full hazmat suits enter. Without a word, they grab me roughly by the arms and drag me down the corridor. Their grip is tight, painful, and I can feel their disdain. To them, I am nothing more than a biohazard. We reach the medical bay, a cold, clinical environment with rows of even smaller rooms. The air smells of antiseptic, and a harsh light casts stark shadows on the walls. They force me onto a bed and strap me down, the restraints biting into my wrists and ankles. Panic surges through me, but the guards are unmoved by my struggles. A nurse, also in a hazmat suit, approaches with a tray of instruments. Her eyes, visible through the mask, are devoid of any empathy. She draws blood, takes swabs, and performs a series of tests with mechanical efficiency, treating me more like a specimen than a human being. Please, please. I croak, my throat dry. What, what's happening to me? She doesn't answer, her eyes flicking away. The silence is suffocating, filled only with the sound of my own labored breathing. Finally, she steps back and nods to the guards, who remove my restraints and leave the room, locking the door behind them. The isolation is maddening. The only contact I have is with the medical staff, who treat me with cold indifference. They poke and prod taking more samples and running more tests, but offer no explanations. My body continues to change. Rashes spread across my skin, turning into raw, oozing sores. My muscles ache constantly, and I feel a persistent fatigue that sleep doesn't alleviate. One of the worst parts of the room is the ceiling mirror. At night, while trying to sleep, under the dim light of the medical bay, I catch glimpses of my reflection. My skin has taken on a sickly, translucent hue, the veins and tendons beneath pulsing with a disturbing rhythm. The sight fills me with a growing dread. Whatever is happening to me, it's far beyond a simple infection. Days blur together in a haze of pain and fear, 
The medical staff grows more distant, their visits shorter and more perfunctory. They speak in hushed tones outside my door, their faces obscured by masks and suits. I overhear snippets of conversation, words like containment breach and contaminated subject that only deepen my terror. One morning, I wake to find a new horror. My fingers have fused together. The skin stretched tight over grotesque, claw-like appendages. I scream, a raw primal sound that echoes through the empty medical bay. A nurse rushes in, her face pale within the protective suit. She takes one look at my hands and backs away, her eyes wide with fear. It's evolving, she whispers, more to herself than to me. The door shuts, and I hear her words muffled through the steel as she keys a walkie. I think we need to let them know what's happening. The guards return, forcing me into a wheelchair, strapping me in tightly and wheeling me down a series of sterile hallways to a new room. Warning, signal interruption detected. This episode is sponsored by June's Journey. Attention all mystery lovers. Dive into the captivating world of June's Journey, the hidden object game that will awaken your inner detective. Join June Parker on her quest to uncover the shocking truth behind her sister's murder in the glamorous 1920s. I'm a couple of chapters in, and I love unlocking new pieces to the mystery after each hidden item search. The beautifully detailed scenes, from New York's finest parlors to the charming sidewalks of Paris, make the experience truly immersive. As you progress, you'll also get to build and customize your very own island estate, complete with stunning gardens and luxurious buildings. Gather compelling evidence, decipher cleverly hidden clues, and unravel the dark secrets of the Parker family. Each twist and turn will keep you on the edge of your seat, eager to crack the case. Cooperate or compete against other players in the detective club, and you'll even get a chance to play in a detective league to test your skills. Are you ready to jump back in time, detectives? Download June's Journey for free today in iOS and Android. This one is bigger, more secure, with reinforced walls and a single observation window. I am alone, completely cut off from the outside world. My condition worsens with each passing hour. My skin splits and cracks, oozing a thick, dark fluid. The pain is unbearable, a constant gnawing agony that never lets up. I feel the bacteria inside me, their tendrils weaving through my flesh, changing me from the inside out. When exhaustion finally takes me, my dreams are filled with nightmares. I see myself as a monstrous, inhuman creature, my body twisted and deformed. The bacteria speaks to me in these dreams. Their voice is a chorus of whispers, promising power and unity. They tell me that resistance is futile, that I must embrace the change. When I wake, I find the transformation has accelerated. My limbs are distorted, my bones bending and warping in unnatural ways. My vision blurs, colors becoming painfully vivid and my hearing sharpens to the point where every sound is an assault. The senior scientist watches on the other side of the glass, occasionally speaking to me through the speakers. Every time the volume sending panic and pain through my deforming body. How are you feeling, Dirk? He asks, his voice tinged with an electric buzz. How do you think I feel? I'm turning into a monster. His voice comes back flat and insincere. 
We're doing everything we can to understand your condition. Your cooperation is vital. Cooperation? I spit. You're treating me like one of the experiments I myself have conducted hundreds of times. What the fuck is happening to me? He sighs, knowing the lies weren't helping. <sighs> I suppose there's no harm in telling you now. The bacteria are integrating with your cells, transforming your DNA. You're becoming a hybrid organism. This is unprecedented. You are the most important discovery this facility has ever seen. His words are clinical, detached, excited even. I'm no longer a person to him, just a subject of study. The realization fills me with a cold, seething rage. That night, I wake from a nightmare to find my body has changed again. My skin is covered in scales, hard and unyielding, and my eyes burn with a fierce, unholy light. The pain is constant. They refuse to turn off the lights no matter how many times I ask. Desperation drives me to a reckless plan. I feign weakness pretending to be far more debilitated than I am. When the nurse comes to take skin samples, she disregards my malformed body, the scalpel gleaming in her hand. I pull at the restraint with my clawed appendage, and it snaps easily, surprising us both. She screams, and my disgusting enlarged hand wraps around her face and head muffling the piercing noise. I pull my other arm free before slashing the restraints holding my lower body. The speaker's cue and the piercing voice of the usually detached senior scientist fill the room. Dirk, listen to me please. Let her go. We're only trying to help you. His voice seems different than before. Unsure. Scared. My lips curl into a sneer at his words, his lies. They'd spent countless days cutting into me, torturing me, uncaring about my situation in any way. I can't help myself. My claws pierce into the woman's skull. She screams a high-pitched sound that cuts into me, so I squeeze harder. A satisfying crunch ushers in the pleasant silence. From behind the glass, I hear a commotion. He's trying to flee. I hurl the nurse's body at the glass, and it explodes in a red, pulpy mess. But as soon as a crack appears in the glass, an alarm is triggered, echoing through the facility. I howl in pain as my large hands cover my ears. Retrieving the nurse's keycard, I hurriedly tap the scanner and exit the room. I stagger down the hallways, my grotesque form barely recognizable. The facility is on high alert. Even through the blaring alarms, I can hear the sounds of boots gathering from somewhere further on. Quickly, I head the other way. I have to stop the noise to get rid of these lights. In the distance, I can hear them, the generators, the beating heart of this facility, powering everything that ailed me. Limping at first, my malformed body cracked and popped. Soon, I picked up speed, faster than I've ever moved, faster than I'd ever seen anyone move. My large ears twitch at every sound. My senses heightened to an extreme. I hear voices, and slow, easing around the corner I see them. Three men dressed in hazmat suits armed with tranquilizers and flamethrowers. I wait for them to continue on, for the optimal moment. Silently I stalk them, 
their chatter about the escaped specimen and following containment protocol echoing in my ears. As the leader reaches for the generator room door, there's a scream as the first one of them falls, his still twitching corpse pooling blood onto the white sterile floor. The other two spin around, panicked looks across their faces, their reactions far too late as my claws carve through their suits like paper, shredding them to bloody ribbons. The sensation, admittedly, quite pleasant. I burst into the room and began tearing through the control boards with ease. After shredding about half of them, the generator powers down and plunges the facility into darkness. The deafening quiet is finally mine. I can think. I can see so clearly in the dark. From somewhere deeper down the maze of hallways, among the dozens of thundering boots, I hear him. The man who'd considered me only as his discovery. My heart beats out of rhythm in one powerful throb. I feel tendrils reaching through my every vein. My body fills with rage and power. Unseen in the darkness, I track his scent and follow it down the winding hallways. My senses go into overdrive, every nerve ending on fire as I home in on him. The faint click-clack of his heels against the cold concrete floor echoes off the walls, drawing me closer. I taste fear and desperation mingling with his sweat. The air hums with anticipation. Every door is flung open as I pass, too easily, nearly flying off their hinges at my touch, revealing empty rooms filled with machinery and equipment. I'm clearly not the only person they were torturing here. That thought lingers in my mind, feeling strange and uncertain. Am I even a person anymore? The thought leaves as quickly as it came when I hear a group of guards rushing in towards me. Their footsteps are loud and careless. They think they are hunting me. My unfamiliar body tenses with anticipation. I wait just inside one of the rooms, holding my body above the doorframe with my claws embedded into the concrete. My tightly woven muscle cords writhe and pulse. I feel them moving and trading places. The exhausted cords switching with the fresh ones. I feel no burning or tiring. Instinctively, I know I can hold this position indefinitely. Flashlights sweep down the hallway and then into the room, quickly moving on when they don't see me. I wait three more heartbeats before silently dropping to the floor. One more heartbeat, sending something that feels like supercharged adrenaline through my shifting veins. In one massive bound, I'm in the middle of the armed security guards. There's ten of them in a disorganized formation. Before they realize what's happening, I've decapitated one of them and severed the legs of two more. Panicked screams echo out among the deafening flashes of gunfire. I've already retreated, springing to the ceiling and then to the opposite wall faster than they can follow with their flashlights. One of them slips in the growing pool of red, his desperate gunfire tearing into several of the other men. Pained yelps and chaotic shifting beams of light only add to the growing confusion. I seize the moment, springing back into the fray, tearing and shredding the men to bloody pieces. At some point, I take a bullet to the abdomen, but hardly feel it. Within seconds, all the men are dead. The obsessively cleaned hallway is a gory mess. Looking at the dismembered pieces of human flesh, I start to feel oddly hungry. 
That thought is washed away, as somewhere further down the hallway, I hear the beep of a security door. That scientist. I can smell his fear and desperation. The scent of his sweat thick in the air. He's running, trying to escape me. I bound down the hallway, not bothering to stop for the doors and tearing through them as if they were cardboard. The sound of his pounding heart is getting closer and closer. I almost laugh as I hear the sound of him tripping and collapsing onto the gleaming white floor. Its mirror-like surface reflecting the red flashing emergency lights. The last door separating me from him explodes off its hinges as I burst through it. He doesn't even have time to turn and look before my clawed hand is wrapped around his neck and holding him off the ground. His body weight feels like almost nothing. The sensation of his rapid pulse begging me to tear into him. He tries to plead with me to choke out some pathetic words, but I don't let him. Instead, I bring his face to mine catching a glimpse of my monstrous visage, reflecting in his wide-eyed, glassy stare. I begin to cut into him in all the places they had cut into me. He gurgles and writhes beneath my grip, his right hand reaching for my face in a half-hearted attempt to cause me pain. I bite it off, chewing with a hateful smile as he shimmies in an almost comical fashion trying to get away from me. His stump, spurting crimson over the sterile white like an abstract artist might paint a canvas. My amusement is overtaken by a sudden realization. The flesh and bones sliding down my throat are divine. I can feel the tendrils inside of me greedily consuming the pieces. I no longer care about taking revenge upon him. I instead take another bite from his gushing stump, and then another. Soon, he has no right arm, so I go for the left. When that's gone, I tear into his abdomen. The organs are even better than the muscle and tendons. At this time, his eyes have rolled back into his head and I can feel his heartbeat slowing. I don't care. I'm overtaken with the sensation of consuming him. So much so that I don't notice the group of armed men approaching me. They are right in front of me, in formation, before I even notice their presence. Something is different about these men. I don't smell fear on them only anticipation. They're organized, well-equipped, carrying gear and weapons I'd never seen before. Something flashes across my nerves, a sense of danger or warning. I'm still trying to decide if I should attack or flee, but they make the choice for me. Several large projectiles pass by me, and I almost think I've overestimated them. Behind me, the projectiles explode and expand, a chemical reaction hissing and filling the space, leaving my only choice to fight my way out. In the next instant, several steel nets are fired and cover me. I slash through the first one, but then electricity flows through them, causing my muscles to lock up. The net begins to tighten as some mechanism whirs. I hear the puff of pneumatic firing mechanisms as nearly a dozen darts puncture my body. I fight and thrash, but soon everything goes dark. The air in the Redwood Bureau's briefing room was thick with tension. I found myself leading this mission as it was a medium priority with a high emphasis on capture, retrieving live as my specialty. 
Screens displayed satellite images and data feeds from the dense forest and research facility where the mission would soon take place. Dr. Emily Turner, the lead analyst for this mission, stood at the front. Agent Gray, she began. We've just been notified of a critical containment breach. Our target is formerly Dirk Hopkins, a scientist working at a top secret facility we've been funding, run by a third party research company. This company is known for its lack of ethical boundaries and extreme human trials. The reason we chose to fund them is simple. They take on the danger and mitigate the risk for us. Any warning signs or breaches are their problem first. We have the data, and in this case, the specimens when your team returns. I nodded, understanding the underlying strategy. What are the mission objectives? Capture Dirk alive at all costs. This could be the missing piece to something the Bureau has been working very hard on for years. We need to study the transformation. But if containment proves impossible, secure tissue samples. And in either case, I want all of their hard drives. Understood, I replied. What about the facility? Turner sighed. The facility is compromised. There's a possibility the bacteria has spread. Get what we need and destroy everything. No witnesses. I stood up, gathering my gear. We'll get it done. As I left the briefing room, I joined my team, a group of elite agents specialized in various forms of combat and reconnaissance. Agent Lisa Chen, an expert in biological threats, adjusted her equipment. You're always taking me on the nicest trips, she said playfully. Welcome to the Redwood Bureau. I'll be your guide for today's fucked up Science Center field trip, I replied sarcastically. Wheels up in ten. The helicopter ride to the drop zone was tense. The rotor's thump carried us significantly faster than anything available to even the military. Our team landed in a small clearing, the dense trees casting long shadows as the sun started its descent below the horizon. Move out, I ordered, my voice low but firm. My team spread out, their movements synchronized and precise. We had done this more times than I could count. As we ventured deeper into the forest, the air grew thick with an unnatural silence. The expected sounds of wildlife were strangely absent, as if nature itself knew what was going on only a short distance away. My team advanced cautiously, their weapons at the ready. Over here, Agent Chen called out, pointing to a break in the trees. It was the path leading to the research facility, obscured by a kind of camouflage paint pattern. We approached the huge metal doors pulling out the override key given to us. Everything was silent until the motorized gears finally pulled open the two steel slabs. An alarm was going off, the power had evidently gone out as well, and the backup lights, probably ran by an external generator, bathed the hallway in a sinister red. Internally, I wondered what made people choose red as an emergency form of lighting. It does fuck all for visibility, and honestly, it sets the nerves on edge. I push these stray thoughts aside and order my team inside, closing the door behind us. No one in, no one out without my say-so. We passed by several labs and a cafeteria filled with cowering personnel. We told them to stay put and that we deal with the situation. Soon after, we heard a commotion from deeper down the halls. Gunfire and screaming, it was brief and ended with a definite silence, which meant only one of two things. And if we were here, you could bet which one of those two things it was. Quietly and quickly, we moved forward, leaving no point of our formation unguarded. Then from just up ahead, we heard a sick, wet, squelching sound. We approached the horrific sight, leaving no mystery as to what this was. A monster, plain and simple. Dirk's grotesque form was hunched over, cradling a scientist. His arms had been chewed off and freely poured blood. The thing that was Dirk now had his face buried in the man's abdomen, chewing and pulling pieces of him out. Blood and gore covered his monstrous hands as he consumed the flesh, organs, and bones with an almost religious fervor. Somehow the poor bastard was still alive, though only just. His head hung backwards limply, giving him a direct line of sight at us, albeit upside down. His mouth moved weakly, trying to communicate something only he would ever know, though I suspect it was a plea for help. It was far too late for him. We moved forward, snapping into formation, taking up the whole hallway with the agents in front kneeling, all our weapons trained on the target. 
its head snapped up, eyes glowing with a feral intensity. For a tense moment, we stared at each other. There was an intelligence behind his eyes. I could tell he was deciding whether to charge or turn tail. With a hand signal, I made that choice for him. Several projectiles were launched past the mutated Dirk. I saw a look across his face like we had missed. For a moment, I could see that he believed we were easy pickings. The projectiles exploded upon impact, releasing a chemical agent that hissed and expanded rapidly, filling the space behind Dirk with a rapidly hardening foam and cutting off any escape route. I knew we could get through it, but certainly not before we contained him. Dirk roared in fury, his miscalculation turning to rage. In the next instant, multiple steel nets were fired, entangling Dirk. He slashed through the first net with ease, but the second net unleashed a powerful electric shock, causing his muscles to convulse uncontrollably. We launched two more and the nets tightened around him, motors whirring as they constricted further. With one last signal, we fired our trank guns and filled him with nearly a dozen darts. Dirk thrashed violently like a trapped porcupine, but the combined effects of the electricity and weapons-grade tranquilizers took their toll. His movements slowed and finally he went slack. We assembled what was essentially a coffin made out of some graphene polymer. I'm not really sure what the stuff is, but it's light and almost nearly impenetrable. Certainly by an entity of Dirk's class. I believe a variation of this stuff is used in creating our body armor. With Dirky Boy locked in the box, we rigged the place with explosives and went back out the way we'd come. Some of the people tried to follow us, but I pointed at the box we were carrying and told them it would be much safer if they waited for the next team. Their faces were a confused mix of trepidation and relief. Of course, that was a lie. As our chopper cleared the blast zone, I keyed the detonator in disbelief at the size of the explosion. We honestly hadn't used that much. I know Dr. Turner told us we wouldn't have to, but damn, she wasn't kidding. RBP-0976, Symbiotic Autonomia, we finally have a sliver of an answer to some very important questions. Dirk Hopkins' transformation was driven by an unknown bacterial strain, thought to be extraterrestrial. I know now through further research, that strain was given to the facility by the Redwood Bureau. They wanted to see what would happen during testing without risking their own facility. This is both a testament to the Bureau's reckless ambition and a harbinger of things to come. The bacteria, with its ability to integrate and mutate human cells, may have been an accidental discovery, but it's now part of a much more sinister and far-reaching agenda, one that ties directly into the Bureau's most clandestine and dangerous initiatives, Project Mutagen. Project Mutagen, a name that has surfaced in leaked files more than once. It is the Bureau's ultimate endeavor to harness biological anomalies for their own ends. The bacteria from the symbiotic autonomia case I now believe is one of the cornerstones of this project. Its unique properties offer a glimpse into the potential for creating hybrid organisms, a goal the Bureau has pursued with unyielding determination, despite the mounting costs and repercussions. The Redwood Bureau funded the third-party research facility precisely because of its lack of ethical boundaries. This agency, known for its willingness to conduct extreme human trials, was the perfect testing ground for some of the Bureau's most dangerous discoveries. By outsourcing the initial phases of their research, the Bureau could mitigate risks and maintain plausible deniability. Following the extraction of Dirk Hopkins, the Redwood Bureau moved swiftly to contain the situation and erase any traces of their involvement. They didn't even use their disinformation specialists for this case. The containment team's orders were clear. Capture Dirk alive and destroy the facility. The surviving staff were locked in the station and killed when the containment team triggered the explosives they'd planted under the direct order of this mission's overseeing agent, Emily Turner. The implications of this case are profound. The Bureau's pursuit of power and control over biological anomalies has led to the creation of horrors that threaten the natural world and everyone living in it. The bacterial strain from the symbiotic autonomia case is just one piece of a larger puzzle. A puzzle that, if completed, could unleash untold devastation. 
We know that Project Mutagen aims to weaponize these biological anomalies, transforming them into tools for the Bureau's agenda. The bacteria's ability to integrate with human cells is a key component of this project, offering the raw potential to create hybrid organisms with greatly enhanced abilities. The Redwood Bureau scientists have never been content with mere containment. They seek to exploit and dominate the forces they can hardly grasp. The truth about the Bureau's activities must be exposed. Their reckless pursuit of knowledge and power endangers us all. By shining a light on their darkest secrets, we can expose their actions and hold them accountable. Only then can we hope to prevent further atrocities and protect ourselves protect from ourselves the nightmares from they, the create. they create. They create. For the ones who know safety isn't a catchphrase, it's a culture. And the ones who help make sure everyone makes it home safe. For the safety-minded who watch everyone's backs, Granger offers supplies and solutions for every industry, as well as safety assessments and training to keep your facilities safe and your people safer. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done.